How's it going, Chico Army and anyone tuning in for the first time? My name is Tyler of Chico Crypto, and you know the drill. Grab a beer, kick back, because it's time for crypto and, of course, a cold one. Today's featured brewski is actually from a member of the Chico Army. His name is Dirk, and he handed me a bunch of German beers. Today's beer is Schoferhofer out of Frankfurt, Germany. It's a Hefenweizen and grapefruit mixed beer. First time ever trying something like this, so I'm excited. Supposedly it's really delicious. Hot damn, that is fucking delicious. Woohoo, baby. Oh. oh, yeah. It is fucking really good. That's a nice mix. If you enjoy today's content and would like to join the ranks of the Chico Army, give me a follow on Twitter, at Chico Crypto, and join the chat on Telegram. T.me slash Chico Crypto One is the link to join. Well, another day, another crash. The free for all Bitcoin has entered is seeming to never end. Dark times and a purge of the market is beginning. This is the definition of cryptocurrency and has happened to Bitcoin multiple times before and the altcoin market once before. This time it's a bit different. As much as it pains me to say this, and even though I don't want to believe it, Tether may have been used as an instrument to artificially pump up Bitcoin and the overall altcoin market artificially. I personally have never liked Tether. It was created to be a stable store of value to protect against cryptocurrency's volatility. Also, since exchanges have had difficult times securing banking relationships, Tether was created for high-speed capital transfers without resorting to fiat and slow bank wires. Now, the actual use of it is to make crypto even more unstable and suck market cap directly from Bitcoin and other altcoins. Anyways, you have high-speed capital transfers with something called a uh, Bitcoin? Now, I gotta give credit to Mr. Bitfinex for compiling all of this research. They are a true warrior of the crypto space and is leading a fight that the Chico army is more than willing to join. Let's begin with a short history of Tether. The Bitfinex exchange started in 2012 and grew into a dominant force shortly after. The first Tether was issued on October 6, 2014, and things seemed all fine and dandy with Tether up until March 6, 2017. The market cap of Tether was only 25 million USD back then, which was a plausible cap. Between March 7, 2017 and January 2018, more than 2.2 billion worth of Tether was issued, with the current issued amount being over 2.58 billion. The web of Tether issuing is deeply complex, but begins with the Tether printer from the Omni blockchain. Tethers are issued here and sent to two different addresses before the complex web of transactions begin, sending to almost every other centralized exchange in the crypto space. Bitrex, Kraken, Binance, Wabi, Goldman Sachs owned Poloniex, OKX, almost every big player is involved with this. Now I've previously dove into a tiny slice of the complex web, showing the flow from the Tether printer into exchanges including Bitfinex, Bitrex, and Poloniex. Let's watch that clip now. This is the Tether printer. The tokens go from the printer right to the Tether treasury address, which can be seen on the Omni blockchain as well. They then get sent to their first exchange, Bitfinex, the only legal partner of Tether. Here is what is weird. There is no USD Tether trading volume on Bitfinex, nor is Tether offered as any trading pair on Bitfinex. The Tethers then get sent to an unknown address, which exclusively then sends the USDT to another exchange, Bitrex. Who owns this unknown address? Bitfinex, of course. Here is why. Who in their minds, some random person, be selling hundreds of millions of dollars to Bitfinex, only then to send it directly to Bitrex? No sense in that right there. We will call this second Bitfinex address Bitfinex B. So as of right now, the two richest addresses of Tether are Bitfinex and Bitrex. Let's climb down the rabbit hole a bit more. Now here is where another massive exchange gets involved, Poloniex. So the second Bitfinex address occasionally gets hundreds of thousands of Tether from a rich list address from Poloniex. This Poloniex address also sends tens of millions to another address under Poloniex's control, which we will call Poloniex B. And here's where things get even weirder. Poloniex A sometimes sends amounts back to the Tether printer, as well as back to Poloniex B. 
It's a flow of cryptocurrency that would make even the best blockchain researchers head spin. So what is going on? Why is this web so complex? And why are all the exchanges willing to participate? Money, of course. Money. <laughs> there is a lot of money to be made with this hustle. Tether is being pushed, not pulled by investor demand. The push is through a supply-driven scam to make up a currency, convert it into Bitcoin, and then manipulate the price of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which they could then cash out those Bitcoins, lining their greed-filled pockets. Here is a chart of the Bitcoin's price, correlated with large prints and tether, right in the middle of last year's bull run, between December 2016 to October 2017. The bars are printing of tethers. As we can see, each time the Bitcoin price started to retrace, the tether printer was turned on. It kept going, printing all the way up until January, as shown in this chart. Then they keep the printing going after the crash, printing more and more when the price was going down in hopes of recovering it. And even a new printer based on the Omni blockchain started to print, Crypto Ruble or RUBT, which is a stable coin to the Russian ruble. The last time Tether printed was in September of this year. If we check out the Tether rich list, we can see the top players in the game today. The Tether treasury holds over 676 million USDT, which still could be issued to exchanges. Looks like Binance is now playing in the dirty game big time with almost the next biggest balance. Then Huobi, then Binance again, which means they have nearly as many Tethers as the Tether printer. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. As we go down the list, we see the other players. Almost all centralized exchanges are in on the hustle. They print to increase the price of Bitcoin, artificially pumping it, then cashing out the Bitcoin they purchased on the users of the exchange, who then lose. This would be all gravy, baby, if Tether was audited, which it hasn't been, and any audit they have proposed is a bullshit lie. Back in January of this year, they actually fired their last person tasked with the auditing job, Friedman LLP. It's now time to unravel who is behind the entire hustle. And this goes back to Mt. Gox even in 2014. And Mt. Gox was the exact cause of the last Bitcoin price bubble back then, where Mark Carpoli's and crew created Bitcoins out of thin air to make up for hacked Bitcoin. And then the whole scheme collapsed when they couldn't sustain the printing of Bitcoin, which in my opinion was not a hacker slowly draining the Bitcoin, but deliberate to run off with a sizable chunk of what they actually had in cold storage. In April of 2014, after the Mt. Gox bankruptcy, a Japanese district court decided to liquidate the assets and repay back those who filed claims. In April of that year, an initiative was put forward called Save Gox, with the aim of auditing Mt. Gox and recouping the losses to investors. Guess who was behind this initiative? Rock Pierce was one, a few other guys, and another important person, John Betts. This will all make sense here shortly. In June 2017, Tether released a transparency update, which is backed by the law firm Free Sporkin and Sullivan, or FSS. The main man we want to focus on is the partner Louis Free. This was called the FSS report and claims Tether's assets are fully backed. Great, but who are these guys and can they be trusted? We will find out that they can. So 2014, Brock Pierce's company, Sunlot Holding Limited, attempted to acquire Mt. Gox in order to restart the exchange. The proposal paper got leaked to the public shown here. And of course we find out, John Betts is a managing partner to the team. And guess who is an advisor to the rehabilitation team? Free Group, who is led by none other than Louis Free, current partner at FSS and Tether's law firm. So who is Louis Free? He is former director of the FBI and former federal judge in New York Southern District Courts. All I have to say is what the fuck. Now, how do these guys tie into Tether exactly? Well, they failed at getting Mt. Gox and having control of the crypto market prices. So in 2014, Brock Pierce went on to create Tether. Here's the evidence now that it was created by him and the deal was signed with Bitfinex. Now, John Betts, who was part of Sunlot Holdings, went on to create Noble Bank which describes itself as a full reserve bank providing real-time post-trade services to OTC markets, including FX and digital currencies. Here is some telling things that prove Noble Banks is tied with Tether. If we go to the free Sporkin and Sullivan attorney client communication document for Tether, we see one of the partners of FSS is Judge Eugene R. Sullivan. Bitfinex himself made the connection. He jumped on Noble Banks' website to see the advisors to Noble Bank. And of course, Mr. Sullivan was right there. 
further confirming that Noble is indeed Tether's bank. This was quickly deleted and that page no longer exists as they're trying very hard to cover the connections. You need further proof? Bitfinex has it. Here's proof that Brock was founder of Noble Markets. But wait, that's not Noble Bank, right? Well, let's see. Here's Noble Markets company profile. Right there is the website, noblegrp.com. You enter that into your web browser and guess what it redirects right back to? Noble Bank's website. This is all too clear. Brock Pierce and Thugs are behind this entire Tether debacle. They're planning to do it with Mt. Gox as they saw and were a part of what could happen to inflating the Bitcoin price. They failed to acquire Mt. Gox so Tether was created. Just like how Mt. Gox's volume was a massive majority of the volume in 2013 and early 14, in the last bull run, this group of thugs have accomplished the same thing with Tethers. Almost all the volume takes place against a single company's unaudited and fraudulent token. Now, why aren't these exchanges fighting back? Because if they stop, all of them will die out. And I personally cannot wait until this house of cards comes crashing down and Tether to go fully away. The space needs to organically grow without these bad actors manipulating the price, even if that means sub 2K BTC. I'm all for it because I love cryptocurrency. Cheers, and as always, I'll see you next time.